Durham Global, leading Britain's conversation, The Nigel Farage Show. Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you very much indeed, Donald. Well, the Office of National Statistics tell us that excess deaths now for this period of the crisis are 53,000. It's a huge number. And I say that on a day when the blame game has now begun because the row over the care home catastrophe, as some see it, um, is reaching such a level that for the first time we're actually getting some pretty aggressive journalistic questions of ministers. And it would appear that ministers are starting to blame scientists and a little bit of vice versa. But there's one really big question in my mind and one that none of the journalists at these daily 5pm pre press briefings ever seem to ask. Joining me is Ben Kentish, LBC's Westminster correspondent. Ben, I never hear this question asked, and yet lots of my friends and colleagues text me, WhatsApp me and say, where is Boris Johnson? Nigel, it wasn't asked at the press conference. No, of course I can not. Tell you, it was asked. It was asked at the uh, lobby briefing that we have with Number Ten every day. Yesterday, where is the Prime Minister? Yeah. It was put to his spokesman. Given when it was announced that these conferences would be carried out every day, the suggestion from Number Ten was that he would be fronting not all of them, but certainly most of them. And yet, I think he's done one, possibly two, in the last fortnight or so, three weeks since he came back to work. Yeah. The answer was, frankly, uh, there wasn't really an answer. The answer was this that we have seen Boris Johnson once or twice and we'll sure uh, no doubt be seeing him again that was the answer well aren't we lucky I, I mean I, I I do I do also notice with no disrespect to George Eustace that the, the you know this started off it was the very senior ministers that were doing these press conferences we haven't seen Rishi Sunak for some time we haven't seen Michael Go for some time they have recently tended to put up slightly more junior cabinet ministers and I wonder uh, alongside only one scientific advisor it does feel a bit like they're not prioritising these as much as they were at the start. Well, they're hoping we get bored, I think, and, and don't ask lots of questions in our own minds. Um, and talking of that press conference, of course, George Eustace, environment, um, the contentious issue of fruit picking, which I'm going to talk about later on today. Uh, did he have much to offer as to how we're going to get the crop in this year? Well, he set up a new scheme, Nigel, Pick for Britain, oh, which right. is a website that people can go to, and they're hoping some furloughed workers might do this, to try and fill the jobs that are effectively vacant for, for picking the crop this summer. Problem was, as soon as he announced it, the uh, website, I went straight to it, and it had gone down, saying <laughs> this service is unavailable, which is the message that farmers have been trying to get across for some weeks now, because there is this shortage. Uh, so that is the plan. That's the plan for picking the fruit. There's a, mm. There'll be another plan needed for where it goes because a lot of the fresh fruit produce that the UK grows, in fact, goes to big corporate, uh, it goes to big events, it goes to restaurants, of course, and there are going to be a shortage of buyers as well as pickers. Big problems for the farming industry and uh, yep. more for George Eustace to announce, I think, in the coming days. Well, I will talk more about that at 6.30, particularly in the light of what Prince Charles had to say on this subject earlier on today and during the press conference did you get the sense ben that a big a bit, little bit of a blame game is beginning to emerge yes i did it started this morning of course nigel when therese coffee the uh work and pension secretary went slightly off script i think it's fair to say and said well if we got decisions wrong then it yeah. was because the science was wrong <laughs> Number 10 were quite quick to slap that down making clear that scientists advise and ministers decide was the phrase boris johnson's spokesman used but it will not have gone down well at all with the uk scientific advisors or the wider scientific community and i actually thought it was possibly the most astonishing press conference we've had yet because dame angela mclean the deputy chief scientific advisor told it exactly how she was there was no attempt to sugarcoat things she said we weren't testing enough because the capacity wasn't in place she said the testing system here still wasn't good enough compared to other countries and that was an operational issue not a scientific one and frankly the tone of her comments was really that things have gone wrong mm. above and beyond the scientific mm. advice and she mm. pointed the blame very much at, at ministers yes. I, I thought it was much more frank than any scientific advisor to the government has been during this epidemic i couldn't agree more ben thank you and we have been used of course to you know chris witty being quite frank with us but uh, far less so from the government and uh, one tory mp unnamed 
has uh, likened this crisis to the famous Morecambe and Wise comedy sketch where composer Andre Previn tells Eric Morecambe he's playing all the wrong notes. To which Morecambe responds, no, I'm playing all the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order. And, and that was in answer to, because we keep being told we took all the right decisions at the right time. And I've said over and again that at least people like President Macron have been on television and levelled with the French public that they made mistakes. We don't get any of that from the government. But today, well, today we did begin to see something very, very interesting. From the start, we've been told we are following the science. Boris kept telling us that we're following the science. And I've said all the way through, scientists disagree. Well, I was very interested to see Sir Adrian Smith, President-elect of the Royal Society, he talked about how crucial it was for the government to be open. And he said, we should really talk about the uncertainty that hangs over science in general. He said, we're fairly sure about how the planets work, but once you get into new viruses, you get extraordinary amounts of uncertainty. Just to say we're following the science, which the government have done, never to ever, ever to have published actually what that scientific advice was, and now to seek, I think, to shift the blame, to pass the buck. Well, see if you agree with me. Listen to Work and Pension Secretary Therese Coffey speaking this morning to Sky News's Kay Burley. At the time, as I say, back in the middle of February, uh, the view very clearly expressed was that the transmission ch challenge in care homes was not one okay, but unlike with hindsight, in other parts. Did you get it wrong? With hindsight, did you get it wrong? You can only make inf uh, judgments and decisions mm. based on the information and advice that you have at the time. Okay, with I recognise things did like you get testing it wrong, capacity. Well, if, this, if the science was wrong, advice at the time was wrong, I'm not surprised if people would then think we made a wrong decision. There we are. If the science was wrong and the advice was wrong, I'm not surprised that people think we made the wrong decision. And you can see now, real pressure coming on, on the government, real pressure, and it is especially over what has happened in our care homes. Yep, there are other arguments and rows about PPE and all the rest of it. Of course there are. But I'm asking you tonight, do you think, and you've seen it there with Theresa May, do you think ministers are now passing the buck when they say, we were following the science. So if it went wrong, it's all the scientists' fault. Let me know what you think about that on 0345 6060 973. Has we're following the science actually been sincere and genuine from the very start? And I, I have to say, I have to say, I, I've wondered for weeks if the public turn against the government, whether this is what the government would do. Just blame the scientists. But ultimately... The big decisions taken about lockdown, when to put lockdown in place, these were not decisions taken by scientists. They were decisions taken by government, decisions taken by ministers, decisions taken by the prime minister. You know, ultimately, if there's blame for how this has happened, it has to go to the prime minister. He's allowed, of course, in mitigation to say, I was given bad advice, but hey, you could have gone to a whole range of scientists and got a lot of different advice. Now, one of the areas where this is really reaching quite a hot temperature is, of course, over care homes. Professor Martin Green from Care England was giving evidence today to the Commons Health and Social Care Committee, and he said there should have been a greater focus on care homes earlier in the pandemic. Let's hear him. We should have been focusing on care homes from the start of this pandemic. What we saw at the start was a focus on the NHS, and that meant that care homes often had uh, their medical support from the NHS withdrawn. We also had the disruption of our supply chains on PPE. So what we did was, we well, also we didn't, and another thing which I thought was, was really interesting about the statistics, what we didn't see was anybody who might have required a hospital uh, intervention going to hospital, and that wasn't only about COVID, that was about other conditions as well. And I think that's why uh, we, we see from Adelina's figures that they might be much higher in terms of the numbers of people who might have had things that weren't COVID related that would have normally had a hospital intervention, and that didn't happen. 
we also saw people being discharged from hospital and we hadn't got the testing regime up and running. So despite what has been said, there were cases, I think, of people who either didn't have a COVID-19 status or were symptomatic who were discharged into care homes. There you are. People who had not been tested, released into care homes, and they weren't all tested until the 16th of April. Cases now coming to light of people who tested positive, being sent back to care homes, who perhaps did not have the right medical facilities to deal with that problem, and in some cases, didn't find out that their own people had tested positive until after they'd returned back. And I thought there, Professor Martin Green was really very, very critical. Who ultimately is responsible for the things that have gone wrong? Is it the government or is it the scientists? Are the government in phase one of trying to pass the buck? 0345 6060 973. Let's get a view from James in Finchley. James, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. How are you? Well, I'm all right, but I, I, I have to say, James, I struggle with these 5pm daily press conferences without reaching for the drinks cabinet. Um, they are. They are largely boring. Nigel, do you remember a certain evening at the end of January when we celebrated getting out of a certain vicious union? I do. I remember it with great glee. And Absolutely. you remember how everybody was shoulder to shoulder? Yep. And the Prime Minister was listening to the scientists who said, don't worry, this is nothing, because the scientists hadn't got the guts to say, we don't know. We don't actually know what's going to happen. And well, shortly afterwards, of course... Everything changed. Well, the 31st of January, of course, was the day. It wasn't just Brexit Day at 11pm that evening. And, and, and yes, I was very pleased to be in Parliament Square with that huge crowd of people. But it was also the day, wasn't it, of the first positive diagnosis in the United Kingdom. Um, James, I, I, you, can, you can not necessarily blame Boris Johnson and the government for not being too alerted to this on the 31st of January. But as the weeks went on, James, this is my view. You know, I was screaming into this microphone every day, look at Milan, look at Italy, look at what's happening in Spain and France. This is, this is us in two or three weeks' time. And for me, the real failure here is inaction. Now, is that the fault of a scientist, James, or is it the fault of the government? Who, in the end, has to, has to stand up and take responsibility. Well, uh, Nigel, I, I look at it this way. You listen to uh, so-called expert opinion, and God knows, I didn't know we had so many professors in the country. <laughs> there are um, lots of them. And then you use your own common sense. That's what, that's what you... You don't blindly follow uh, the advice given by people. I mean, in life, you can listen to an accountant or a lawyer or a surveyor, and then you decide yourself. So were you not, James, were you not... Because when Boris told us, and still tells us, we're following the science... I cringed. Right, because it's done to reassure us, but it hasn't worked with you, has it? Certainly not. No, Certainly James, not. James, thank you for your call. It is now 16 minutes past six. Time for the news headlines with Thomas Watts. The Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has warned there's no guarantee of an immediate bounce back for the British economy. The Environment Secretary has rejected suggestions the government took the wrong approach to dealing with the coronavirus in care homes. And claims for unemployment benefit in the UK rose by nearly 70% in April, the first full month of the lockdown. Rain fading in the north, remaining dry and clear in the south, a low of 10 Celsius. LBC Travel, I'm Dave Goff. It's very slow in Bexley on the A2 westbound after a car caught fire earlier at the Black Prince interchange, but all the lanes are open again. It's slow in Woolwich on Beresford Street westbound at McBean Street because a car's broken down so one lane is shut. In Selhurst, the A212 Whitehorse Road is closed both ways at Northcote Road for a police investigation. It's heavy in Clapham. Old Town is blocked at Wingate Square because of an accident. In Felton, the A312 Causeway is partly blocked in both directions at Fags Road. That's because of an accident. And if you need to take the train, Southern have the of up to 15 minutes between East Croydon and Oxted. That's because of a signalling problem. This is LBC. If you want a career in media, your future starts here. The Global Academy, a unique school recruiting students for Year 10 and Year 12 who want to work in broadcast and digital media. There's nowhere that really can offer what the Global Academy offers. We're all here to do the same thing. We're all interested in media. Whatever it is you want to do. The Global Academy, rated good by Ofsted. Get more info and apply now for September 2020. 
Search Global Academy. LBC. At Barnes Rofe Accountants, we know that future business planning for our clients is essential through these unprecedented times. But with the right strategic advice and support, we can guide you on the steps you can take to ensure your business is ready to get back on its feet post-COVID-19. To arrange a free consultation with one of our partners to review your business and get it future ready, please visit barnesroof.com. This is an important update from the government about coronavirus. We all need to stay alert so we can control the virus and reduce the risk of infection. Staying alert means you must stay at home as much as possible. Work from home if you can. Limit contact with others. Keep your distance if you go out. And wash your hands regularly. Do not leave home if you or anyone in your household has symptoms. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. At Filippo Berio Olive Oil, our master blenders never stop until they find the perfect flavor worthy of our founder's signature that you will still see on every bottle. Filippo Berio. His signature, our promise. Find us at your supermarket today. When you buy car or home insurance, you can choose a free gift with Confuse.com rewards, like a £20 Domino's or Halford's voucher, £20 Shell Fuel, or a Now TV Pass, all for free. But, no but, because that's what free means. No ifs, buts, or maybes. Don't be confused, be confused.com. Available on single annual policies, now TV 18 plus. Shell excludes Northern Ireland, full T's and C's online. This is LBC, the Nigel Farage Show. Call 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage on LBC. And of course, it's not just a health crisis. It is an e very much an economic crisis too. And we got some figures today for UK unemployment and at the end of April UK unemployment was 2.1 million that was a jump in April of 856,000 so a lot of people out there economically having a very very tough and very very worrying time now Michael in Croydon says why not have a show on what's gone right for a change Nigel the NHS wasn't overwhelmed financial support schemes have been implemented quickly and work well give some credit stop playing the blame game Michael I do I I said I thought it was amazing how they put together, turned the Excel Centre into that Nightingale Hospital. I was full of praise, absolutely full of praise. Where I think they've got things right, I am full of praise. And by the way, listen in at 6.45, Michael. I will talk about Brexit and I will talk about the UK's chief negotiator. And you'll never have heard praise like it, I promise you. But in terms of the way this has been handled by the government from the start, I think it's been pretty dreadful, frankly. And I think week by week, when we see levels of confidence in the government and how they're dealing with this, I think those numbers are beginning to agree with me. People want to support the government in a crisis, but frankly, they're not levelling with us. They're not being straight with us. And now they're in the process of trying to shift the blame, believe you me. Scientific evidence is just about health. The government have to make decisions that are also based on the economy. Messrs Whitty and Valance are not econom economists or politicians either. I think they've been thrown under the bus. No, not yet, but they will be. Mark my words. Let's go to Phil in Guildford, a new caller. Phil, do you think the government is trying to pass the buck here? Well, I do, to a certain extent, Nigel. I mean, I... I'm getting sick of watching these press conferences day <laughs> after day where the government um, stand up there and even though we've got the benefit of hindsight, they don't admit for it that they've done even a tiny thing wrong. And as a result, the only questions the press are asking are, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Do you admit you made a mistake? Why don't they just turn around and say, look, with the benefit of hindsight... We've done a few. We've made a few mistakes. If we yes. did this all over yes. again, we yes. might do it slightly. I'd differently. love to hear that, Phil. Wouldn't you? I would. And uh, everyone would be on their side. Then they think, okay, fair enough. They they said now looking back, actually they should have done this a bit earlier. They should have done that. Yes. And then the press wouldn't have instead of this gotcha stuff. The press would actually be asking 
questions that we want to hear the answers to, rather than, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And the government just constantly squirming. So when you hear... just admit Phil, they messed up? Phil, when you hear them saying every day, we took all of the right decisions at the right time, how do you respond to that? Well, it's, it's ridiculous. There's not a country on, in, the, in the world that can say that with the benefit of hindsight. Oh, everything we did, we did perfectly. Because if they did, we wouldn't have any of this... They wouldn't have mm. any cases, would they? So... I mean, it's just a silly thing to say. We made all of the right decisions at the right I, time. I, I couldn't so, agree more. Phil, I couldn't agree more. And I, I don't know whether you're a regular listener, but I've made the point about Emmanuel Macron levelling with the French nation that he underestimated the scale of this. They made mistakes, but they're doing their best. That's what we want to hear. Phil, I agree with you, and I thank you very much. Nigel, the led by the science mantra was always designed as a get-out-of-jail-free card. The ridiculous thing with all of this is that any science worth their salt will tell you that mistakes and the subsequent admitting of them are at the very heart of research. I despair, says Paul in Lancaster. If they didn't follow the science, they would still be blamed. Well, Adam in Crawley, uh, you know, you could argue the government can't win either way, but, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Big decisions that are made by great statesmen and great stateswomen. They listen to lots of people. They then make a decision and they are then judged on the result. Let's go to Lingfield and speak to Sean. Sean, good evening to you. Hi, Ian. How are you doing? Doing all right, but I must Pretty admit, good-o. every time I see Matt Hancock or, or George Eustace, or I just I'm losing respect for them, Sean. <laughs> Didn't you beforehand? Well, anyway, no, I mean, I look, you know, you know, I mean, I, I, I think there are one or two competent people there. Uh, but most of them I see just purely as career politicians. And that's why they will try and shift the blame, because saving their jobs is all that really matters to them, Sean. OK, well, look, my own personal view, OK, is the failure is mainly due to a combination of a lack of importance given to the pandemic and the consequences thereof that will happen after it arrives. Now, we've lost a lot of people. Uh, On the news earlier, it said there are 50,000 more deaths than uh, average this time in any other year. So we can or cannot believe the fact there are 35,000 COVID-19 deaths. Personally, I believe it's a lot more. Regards to um, hindsight, well, we can all, you know, play on that one, can't we? You know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, so they say. Personally, I don't think it is a wonderful thing. I think it's an awful thing because it just goes to show the failures that we've um, inherited sure. because of the lack of hindsight. But I think the information and the importance and the knowledge um, that we didn't have, that we now have, is not the case to push the blame to someone at the end of the day no one got it right and we all should realize that Uh, uh, people have died yes they're going to die okay so what we need to do is continue and to work forward now let's just take an example say the nightingale hospital okay prior to this pandemic we had a lack of beds in hospital Mm. so what happens at the end of the day do we close the nightingale down after spending all that money or do we keep it open to ease the uh, pressure on the nhs for future illnesses uh, or maybe well i think to be honest with you um sean such is the backlog with over 50 percent of people needing uh, you know coronary examinations not having been seen such is the backlog uh, that I think they could be, they, they could prove to be very, very useful. Could prove to be very useful in a time to come. Sean, I mean, I, you know, I was accused of being too anti-government from the start, and my my real big beef from day one with all of this was that we were allowing flights to come in from Italy, then New York, China, you name it. We were importing the virus into our country without lifting a finger to test anybody, to isolate anybody, to quarantine anybody. And Sean, I think I was right to say that. Uh, I agree with you completely, and in fact, you know, it, it, it turns my my blood to see all of these people arriving in the country where they're not being screened, they're not, they're just being let let out, if you like, or, or allowed to to land. You know, you've been doing this thing going down to Dover and seeing yes. boatloads yes. of immigrants come in. There is there is a way we can stop them, and there is a way we can control our borders. We don't do it. But we there's just lots don't of do things it. we don't do, and we should do. We should realise this, and we should crack on with it. I, I, I'm, I'm just absolutely amazed that we can have 
you know, a thing called a government which is so powerful and so influential, and yet we can't trust them. It doesn't matter who it is, whether it's left wing, right wing, middle of the road. It doesn't matter well, who it is. The I'm, people and, cannot trust I'm, them because I'm, they I'm, don't act on what we want them to act upon. If they were straight with us, we might. Thank you. Nigel, you won't see much of Boris these days. He's busy changing nappies. As for Lord Dayton, more like Lord Lucan, says Will in Wigan. Will, how many times have I said, where is Lord Dayton? He's now been appointed for a month to sort out PPE. He hasn't given a single interview. He hasn't said a dicky bird. I just don't get it. Let's go to Saxmundham in Suffolk and speak to Sophie, a new caller. Good evening, Sophie. Um, good evening. Actually, it's Framlingham, not Saxmundham, but that's not important right now. Well, it's pretty close, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, I just want to say there's been an absolute tragic cost of lives. The loss of life is absolutely appalling. It could have all been avoided. The government have been like a car crash. Where's Boris? Piers Where's Johnson, Boris? Uh, none of them... No, none of them, Piers Morgan, none of them will appear on television. They don't like being questioned. They're passing the buck. And, you know, the, the year ones who they're going to send back to school shortly could do a better job of it. Um, is it possible that Piers Morgan has been a bit over the top? No, I think he's been fantastic. He's the only one that dares say it like it is, like you, Nigel, you know that. OK, OK. Now, I mean, some people say that Piers has been over the top and that's why ministers won't go on because, frankly, he's verging on rude. But you think, frankly, they're just scared of him, yeah? I think they're scared of him, but I think they've made an absolutely appalling job. Boris Johnson has got blood on his hands. Well, look, there was whatever happened here, we were going to be in for a horrible time. But I think the errors over delaying when lockdown came in and the and what has happened, Sophie, over care homes is an absolute tragedy. It's ghastly. Um, and uh, what could they do anything, Sophie, to re-establish trust with you? No, I never, never. I, I, I tell you, I've been, a, I've been a Tory supporter all my life, and I'm going to re- Labour now. Interesting. We'll come to that as the months go on. Sophie from Framlingham in Suffolk. Thank you very much indeed. Nigel, did Greece follow the science? I'm asking this because the number of deaths were a tiny fraction of the developed EU countries. When will this be properly analysed? Steve in Hampshire. Well, uh, go to, you know, on Twitter, go to at LBC, see the interview I did last week with Yanis Kazamutis, a political analyst in Greece, and he explained to us, he explained to us that actually the government did act uh, and people trusted the government in what they were doing. Greece has come out of this amazingly, remarkably, phenomenally well. It is now 6.30. Time for the news with Thomas Watts. The Chancellor has warned of a severe recession, the likes of which we haven't seen after a surge in unemployment claims. Rishi Sunak told the Lords Committee there's a risk of long-term scarring to the British economy. Ministers have been accused of being too slow to tackle the coronavirus in care homes in England. Professor Martin Green, the Chief Executive of Care England, which represents providers, has called for a forensic examination of government planning. The Environment Secretary has called on British people to help harvest this year's crops because of a shortage of migrant workers. But within minutes of George Eustace's announcement, the website listing job opportunities had crashed. And the weather. Any showers in northern areas will fade through the evening, largely dry and clear in the south, a low of 10 Celsius. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. The unemployment up by 50,000 to 1.35 million in the quarter. Work and pension secretaries, coffee. Our figures that we have available publicly from the ONS uh, takes us to the end of March, so we're actually still at record employment rates. What does the government modelling or projection for the level of unemployment predict? We anticipate that with that many people claiming universal credit, obviously that will feed through into the next set of stats about the people formerly unemployed. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. With zero. Get your business digital ready with zero accounting software. LBC. During this challenging time, you may be worried not only about your health, but also your livelihood. If you're self-employed or run a business of any size, you can find information on the schemes available to support you and your employees online. Go to gov.uk forward slash business dash support. Get help. Protect your business. Save jobs. Even in the toughest of times, there are usually opportunities for relief. Right now, many husbands and dads, through no fault of their own, are struggling to stay current with financial orders or child maintenance. The economic effects of coronavirus may allow the modification of financial support obligations, so it's important to act immediately. At Cordell & Cordell, we've stepped up our service procedures to bring you the support you need now. CordellCordell.co.uk, a partner 
men can count on. When it comes to finding something new, you can start the conversation at Hello You. Sign up and browse profiles for free at HelloYouDating.com and start the conversation today. Your company is doing pretty well. Your tax position's okay. So what's keeping you awake at night? To face the future with confidence, talk to Vision Consulting. We've expanded from Gantz Hill to the Gherkin, with clients from the fishmonger to the multi-million pound property investment company. And our growth as a firm of chartered accountants and registered auditors is based on our passion for our clients' business. Have confidence in your accountant. See visionconsulting.co.uk. This is an important update from the government about coronavirus. We all need to stay alert so we can control the virus and reduce the risk of infection. Staying alert means you must stay at home as much as possible. Work from home if you can. Limit contact with others. Keep your distance if you go out. And wash your hands regularly. Do not leave home if you or anyone in your household has symptoms. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Fruit picking, the harvest, fruit and vegetables. The season was well, started already actually with asparagus and of course goes right on through well into October with apples, etc. And we've covered this on the show before because I keep saying that people I know, friends of mine indeed, have applied for fruit picking jobs and can't get any jobs, yet we're told there's a shortage. Well, into all of this today, strode Prince Charles to talk about Pick for Britain. Let's listen to him. At this time of great uncertainty, many of our normal routines and regular patterns of life are being challenged. The food and farming sector is no exception. If we are to harvest British fruit and vegetables this year, we need an army of people to help. Food does not happen by magic. It all begins with our remarkable farmers and growers. If the last few weeks have proved anything, it is that food is precious and valued and it cannot be taken for granted. This is why that great movement of the Second World War, the Land Army, is being rediscovered in the newly created Pick for Britain campaign. In the coming months, many thousands of people will be needed to bring in the crops. It will be hard graft, but is hugely important if we are to avoid the growing crops going to waste. Harvesting runs until early autumn and people are needed who are genuinely going to commit. The phrase I've often heard is pickers who are stickers. Now, I do not doubt that the work will be unglamorous and at times challenging, but it is of the utmost importance and uh, at the height of this global pandemic, you will be making a vital contribution to the national effort. So I can only urge you to pick for Britain. So that was Prince Charles urging us to pick for Britain and bringing up analogies of the land army, the women particularly that went out and worked in the fields in the early 1940s. As I say, I've talked about this before. Um, and George Eustace, the environment minister, who of course comes from a family that run fruit farms, uh, was talking about this today. And uh, he said, oh, well, we got, we've got a website, Pick for Britain, which apparently has gone down. But it really isn't good enough. You know, a colleague of mine, former former Brexit Party colleague, but a farmer, a uh, businessman called Rupert Lowe, member of the European Parliament Agriculture Committee, wrote, wrote to, to Eustace on the 4th of May to say, look, something fishy is happening here. It would appear that many farmers don't want British pickers because they want to bring people in from Romania and Bulgaria because those people then stay in their accommodation, stay in their caravan, stay in pretty low quality accommodation. And of course, the money they pay for that is tax free money for the farmers. Now, to be fair, farmers are under huge pressure, particularly from the supermarkets. But that's been my suspicion all through this. And I, when I heard yesterday, that the so-called quarantining at the airports that Boris Johnson promised us nine days ago, there might be exceptions and exemptions, certain air bridges to, company, to certain countries with low coronavirus rates, I wouldn't be surprised if in a few weeks' time there weren't lots and lots of flights coming in from Romania and Bulgaria. It would appear that is what 
our farmers want. And I don't buy the argument that all the Brits are useless and lazy. I just don't buy it. And I do also wonder that some people who are working on these farms are working in conditions that are not too far away from modern-day slave labour. And I wonder whether that's good enough. Had some response to this um, on Twitter. Call it limited national service. Call up those unfortunate people that have been unemployed for a year or more. Don't use furloughed people as they will have a job to go back to. Brexiteers need to go and pick the farmer's fruit and veg. Uh, Mr Farage in particular. Yeah, well, great. OK, fine. Oh, another one here. What do you say now we have no fruit pickers? The ones you said shouldn't be here. Brits don't want the work. They're too lazy. When will it sink in? You're right. All our young people are useless and lazy and we should throw them onto the scrap heap. The first time I heard this argument made was by Tony Blair in 2004 and the argument that our people are useless was made because he'd opened up the doors unconditionally to former communist countries and he knew that the big employers and the big landowners wanted the cheapest possible labour. That's not to say that many of them that come from those countries aren't great people and don't work hard, but I really, really am concerned that people I know who've applied have found it very, very difficult to get jobs. I hope this Pick for Britain website solves it, Mr Eustace, but I do have my doubts. Nigel, would you be willing to go picking fruit, says Stephen in Suffolk? If I was skint, Stephen, of course I would. Prince Charlie is a bit out of touch. Romanians have already been brought in to do most of the fruit picking. When Brits apply, there's no work. Strange but true. No, Beth, it's not true. We do not have as many Romanians and Bulgarians here at this moment in time. Isn't it funny? Before 2004... We didn't have large numbers of Romanians and Bulgarians, and I didn't hear about crops rotting in the fields. Let's get back to the blame game. Let's get back to, are the government, is Theresa Coffey, what we saw earlier, you know, is she, when she kind of says, look, you know, if the science was wrong, the advice at the time was wrong, then that's why we were wrong, i.e. we weren't wrong, the scientists were wrong. It is the blame game. Who in the end should take responsibility? We're going to go to Whitechapel in East London and speak to Dan, who's a new caller. Welcome, Dan. Good evening. Hi there, Nigel. Thank you so much for having me on your show. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I just, oh, I'm so frustrated by some of these things. And I, you know, the idea that we're just going to blame the scientists is really, I think, career politics at reaching a new low point, Dan. Definitely. And I think the thing is, this is really doing nothing to help the average person in Britain, all this shifting the blame. No, it isn't. I mean, what does the average person in Britain want, Dan, in your view? I think the average person in Britain really wants to know what's going on and they want to be able to get back to work. I mean, I work yeah. in a restaurant and I've got no oh. idea when when I'm going to be able to go back. Funnily enough, Roger, actually, um, I learned about your show from some of my regulars and I do miss them very dearly. Ah, what they were chatting about LBC, were they? They, they were. <laughs> unfortunately, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't seen them in a long time because, unfortunately, we actually had to stop serving white supremacists. Oh, very good, Dan. You are a really, really smart guy. Let's go to Chris in Cardiff, who's new to the show. Hi, Nigel. Good evening. So, who's to blame? Is it right that politicians now blame scientists? Well, let me say... Slung myself in a bit of a twilight zone because politically, I'd say that I come at, from the opposite end of the spectrum to yourself. Um, and in the last few days, I found myself agreeing with first Piers Morgan on something, and this <laughs> evening you. So I felt like I had to give you a call. Um, and well, well, Chris, Chris, actually, actually, I mean, I, you know, I, I think this political spectrum stuff is out of the window when it comes to this kind of debate, isn't it? Well, I spent a coronavirus, absolutely, and I think with. Um, this blame game. I think the government have been building up to this since day one. Ever since they started talking about we're taking the advice of scientists, it's the scientists' advice that we're following, it's been heading towards this. It's been heading towards a blame game and this government blaming the scientists for the advice that they gave. So pass the buck at the end of the day. 
Chris, your line is not great. I'm going to love you and leave you, but do come back to us another time. Let's go to Bracknell and speak to David. David, good evening. Oh, yeah, good evening. Um, hello there. Um, Nigel, yeah, I, you, was, you mentioned at the top of the show about the um, NHS and their role in the people being returned to the care homes, yes? Well, somebody, managers somewhere took these decisions, or in public <clears throat> health, or public health England more like, but someone yeah. somewhere. I mean, you know, David... I'm accused of blaming the government all the time. Actually, actually... It's nothing to do with the government. It's, it's the not, management of the NHS yeah, Trust. No, no, They're uh, responsible for yes, yes, sending no, these people I, back I, into the care homes. I, David, I absolutely get that. I do get that. And not everything is the government's fault. But then, you know, to get Boris Johnson to be critical in any way of anything anyone in the mm. NHS has done is virtually impossible at this moment in time, isn't it? Well, my friend has been warning since he used to work for the Public Health Laboratory, the precursor to the... Um, Public Health England about the ineffectual and um, out of touch management of the NHS for well over a decade now. So it was he predicted all this happening at the moment. Actually, He's, he did he did a research paper on what would happen in the care homes. Mm, well, he knows exactly what's going on far more than I do. But yeah. the, the, they've got somebody should be questioning the head of these trusts and and t bringing them to account. Yes, and the role of Public Health England, David. I mean, they seem to be behind the curve. Yes, he, he said to me it's gone downhill considerably since uh, since it was um, the, the public health laboratory. Yeah, yeah. I was amazed yesterday. Finally, you know, when so many people two months ago were saying, "Look." They've lost their sense of taste, lost their sense of smell. Could this be a symptom of coronavirus? No, 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 we were told. Other countries recognised that it was. And just yesterday, Public Health England said, yes, actually, it isn't just a dry cough and a high fever, uh, but that counts too. They are very, very slow with much of this. David, thank you for your call. Carl in Birmingham says, where is the leadership? Boris is no Churchill or Margaret Thatcher. At this time, we need a strong leader. Care homes have been overlooked to save the NHS. Uh, it, I mean, it could be, Carl, and I don't know. I don't know. But is it that Boris actually is still seriously under the weather? I, I, I really don't know. But the lack of leadership from our Prime Minister at this moment in time is just extraordinary people are beginning to notice people are talking about it there's all sorts of memes um, going up on twitter and elsewhere the public are having a conversation about it and yet i don't hear any journalists asking it at the daily press conference i'm told it was asked in a downing street briefing but uh, yeah we need a proper leader and that is not george eustace doing a 5 p.m press conference all around the rest of the world Presidents and Prime Ministers are heading up in front of the public their government's response to what is going on. They take the criticism. At times they admit, many of them, that some things they've got wrong. We keep being told by a series of career ministers that they took all the right decisions at the right time. And now they're saying if some of those decisions weren't right, it's not their fault, it's the scientists. I just don't think that's good enough. It's 6.45, time for the news with Thomas Watts. The Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has warned of the prospect of long-term scarring of the British economy. Another 545 people have died in the UK after testing positive for COVID-19, bringing the total number of deaths to 35,341. The head of Care England has strongly criticised the government's approach to tackling the outbreak in care homes. Rain fading in the north and remaining dry and clear in the south tonight, a low of 10 Celsius. LBC Travel, I'm Dave. Golf in Feltham, the A312, the causeway is partly blocked in both directions at Fags Road because of an accident. It's heavy in Clapham. Old Town is blocked both ways at Wingate Square because of an accident. There were delays on the South Circular Road around the Catford Gyratory in both directions. That's because of the roadworks. In Beckenham, Churchfields Road remains closed in both directions between Beckenham Road and Clement Road because of a fight in a building. It's very slow in Tottenham on Ferry Lane in both directions because of roadworks near Tottenham Hale Station. And if you need to take the train, Southern have delays of up to 15 minutes between in East Croydon and Oxford. That's because of a signalling problem. Coming up at seven on LBC, Ian Dale. At nine, I'll be hosting a phone-in on loneliness, which has become such an important area of mental health that there's even a minister for it. Ian Dale on LBC. When you can't even predict what next week will bring, why tie yourself to a 12-month business insurance policy? 
Give your business the flexibility it needs right now with Digital Risks Online. Fully customized cover that you can add to as your business grows or change if your business evolves without any penalties. Digital Risks, award-winning pay-by-the-month business insurance for modern, fast-changing times. Get your online quote in minutes at digitalrisks.co.uk. At Filippo Berio Olive Oil, our master blenders never stop until they find the perfect flavor worthy of our founder's signature that you will still see on every bottle. Filippo Berio, his signature, our promise. Find us at your supermarket today. If it's essential that you travel by train this May, here's some important news from us at Network Rail. There are engineering works planned for the late May bank holiday weekend. Some services may change and some will not be running. If you really must travel, please plan ahead by checking nationalrail.co.uk. Hello? This is the most important piece of advice I'm going to give you in your life. Hello? What was that, Dad? Hello? Dad, I can't even hear you, man. You get me? I didn't get it, Dad. You didn't get it? I meant... You didn't... Hello? You must be playing English. What? You want to answer me back? I'm not answering you back. You think your father is a... I am not going to repeat myself. <sighs> Man. Tired of bad connections? Enjoy great quality calls with Boss Revolution, the international calling app. Download the Boss Revolution app today and get £2 free call credit. Leading Britain's conversation, LBC, The Nigel Farage Show. Well, time for some praise for the government. They were elected on one big thing, and that was to get Brexit done after the absolutely catastrophic failure of Theresa May. Uh, they're coming forth in the European elections, their worst result in the 200 years of their history, and they realised they had to sort Brexit. Now, we're in these negotiations, we're entering an absolutely crucial few weeks. Yep, we left politically the Union on the 31st of January at 11pm, but... We are still in the single market. We're still in the customs union. We're still being a judge for the European Court. We're still paying money. Um, and, and we're still effectively members uh, in all but name. So we have to sort out this transition period. Uh, and many of us very passionately do not want that to be extended into 2021 or 2022. And Michel Barnier is not a happy man. Now, I know Barnier pretty well. Normally, very, very cool. Part of the reason for that was he always had the upper hand over a weak, ineffectual foreign office who really were on Mr. Barnier's side more than on our side. And of course, in the negotiations with Theresa May and Ollie Robbins, who's now, of course, Sir Ollie Robbins, obviously, um, Barnier pretty much got what he wanted surrender and Brexit in name only. Now, private reports suggest that he, is, he seemed to be uh, away from the camber, angry, fractious um, and he knows he is now losing in these negotiations that the British now have the upper hand one reason he is angry and I perhaps understand is much of what was in that withdrawal agreement which Boris Johnson called oven ready actually was awful uh, and what the British are doing is saying look you know they're picking selectively uh, from some of the wording that they want so Barney has got a, a slight point in that we have kind of changed our tack from that evening in October when Boris Johnson signed it. But we are acting as a true sovereign nation. And today there is a letter to Michel Barnier sent by the UK's chief negotiator, David Frost. Um, and one thing I like about this, it's out there, it's published, it's open, it's transparent. That's good. Uh, and he goes through sector by sector, fisheries, etc. You know, he points out that that, you know, free trade agreements such as the ones you've done with Canada or Japan would suit us. A fisheries deal such as the one you've done with Norway would suit us. On financial services, he says to Barnier, that the EU's market access offer on financial services is even less than you've tabled thus far with Australia and New Zealand. He really doesn't pull his punches. Your text contains novel and unbalanced proposals. And he finishes up at the end of a letter saying, what is on offer is not a fair free trade relationship between close economic partners, but a relatively low quality trade agreement coming with unprecedented EU oversight 
of our laws and institutions. And all I can say about what David Frost is saying and doing at this moment in time is 10 out of 10. Keep running for the line. Make them know that of course we'll leave on a WTO Australia type arrangement. Of course we're taking back control of our waters. Of course we're going to stop paying the money. Of course we're going to become an independent country. And if you stick with that, I think they'll probably cave. And if they don't cave, any downside difficulty that is caused uh, by leaving without a specific agreement uh, will be far, far outweighed by the risk of staying inside something that increasingly looks like a sinking ship and the row between Italy and Germany is one that is not going to go away in a hurry. We got off we got off the train at the right moment. Back to the blame game. Back to is it fair for ministers now to blame scientists? Surely they're the ones that should take credit and responsibility for what happens during this crisis. I'm going to, to Mike in shirt who's new to the show. Mike, good evening. Hello, Michael. Yes, I feel that ministers really should take back the responsibility. It's only because scientists do facts. That's their currency. Um, they um, produce uh, evidence. They then assemble it, and then they sort of package it, and they go to these various political assemblies in Westminster, and they, um, I don't know, they, they uh, do you know what? I, do, do you know what I'm thinking, Nigel, is that they kind of wither on the vine at the moment? Do you? Yes, I do. Um, uh, dare I'm... I say it, your, your, um, one of your um, colleagues of the past, Donald Trump, has sort of, uh, 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 sort of, I don't know, diminishes the sort of like opinion of um, the scientists. Um, I'm wondering whether we're doing the same thing ah, at but, the moment. Ah, but Mike, you know, you, scientists use, you, you know, you, you talked about how scientists operate. Scientists use research and figures uh, and put those into assertions and theories. You know, scientists rarely agree on things, Mike. Well, no, I agree. I, you know, funny enough, uh, 30 years ago, uh, I was a scientist myself. Ah, uh, but, ah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Brunel University, uh, ke chemistry uh, degree. Okay. Uh, wasn't, ter wasn't terribly good at it, but um, at the end of the day... <laughs> I love in, the honesty. Uh, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, ended up in magazine publishing. Um, but anyway... Uh, the point being is, is uh, funny enough, those disciplines that I had learned, funny enough, have followed me throughout the uh, throughout the decades. Uh, the point, but the point being is, is that whatever scientists sort of like come up with, whatever model they come up with, and this is actually really very, very important now. It's not not been as important uh, as um, as it was back in the day when I was uh, no, a, but, a student. But, Mike, ultimately, you know, the big decisions are taken by politicians. They're the ones that should be responsible. Well, that's right. Not trying to shift the blame. And that really, I think, is the big point. Mike, pleasure to speak to you. Thank you. Um, Aaron says, question to ask the government, what questions did they ask the scientists and when? Well, you see, there's an, 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 you know, another point. Just saying we followed the science and then not publishing any of it does not necessarily help. I find it crazy that our Prime Minister is AWOL. I also agree. Put your hands up and say, well, you got it wrong. Yeah, I, I know, uh, Sue in Norfolk, uh, we, we need some honesty about this. And for Matt Hancock to keep telling us that care homes were his absolute priority from, from, from the beginning patently is not true. Kieran is calling from Hampstead and is a new caller. Good evening, Kieran. Hi there, Nigel. Um, yeah, I was going to say that, um, well, firstly, if uh, the government are now saying that the scientists got it wrong, we have to remember that there's a government that appointed these scientists, if that is, is, that, if that is the case. Um, yeah. uh, Chris Whitty, uh, Patrick Valens, I think, were, I believe, were appointed by the new, effectively, uh, Johnson government, uh, replacing two very long-standing um, uh, chief medical officers and scientific officers, I believe. 
Uh, so yeah. if that is the case, they've appointed um, ineffectual or ineffective scientists uh, and, and then followed their advice and now obviously blaming them. But, it, I mean, that, that point could carry forward because I think the principle uh, is showing itself that Boris Johnson, and by Johnson I also mean Donna Cummings, um, have a, a, a poor judge of character. They've selected a poor group of politicians to represent the UK, possibly uh, with the exception of Rishi Sunak, um, but the rest of them, certainly Dominic Raab, um, certainly Matt Hancock. Well, I mean, the theory, Kieran, the theory, Kieran, is, the theory is that what they didn't want, what the Cummings-Johnson alliance didn't want, uh, was a group of disloyal ministers who would start to leak information. What they didn't want were any particularly bright stars that might begin at times to outshine the Prime Minister. So they went for people who were solid career politicians who would do as they're told. That is a theory, some think, in Westminster, uh, Kieran. Possibly. I mean, yeah, I mean, certainly uh, characters that were loyal to uh, the, the Johnson-Cummings partnership. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, people like Matt Hancock probably will take the, the biscuit as the sort of the worst appointment of all. Who, who would have thought in, uh, in, in six months ago that you'd have had a, better, a worse uh, health secretary than um, Jeremy Hunt? But they, they seem to find one. Well, do you, know what, do you know what, Kieran? I think Jeremy Hunt actually has come across quite well in this crisis. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm no fan of him, and, I, and I'll, I'll point out that a lot of failings with the care home system and other areas that we're, we're struggling with now due to well, COVID-19. I'll, I'll work on, on well, his watch. Well, Kieran, and, and, and we're out of time, Kieran, but isn't it funny to hear Jeremy Hunt today saying, actually, care homes and the NHS need to be more closely aligned in terms of how we run things. Thank you very much indeed. I'll finish on this note on Twitter. I'm sick and tired of being called lazy. British people aren't lazy. They just want to be paid a decent wage. Nothing wrong with that. And I couldn't agree with that more. This argument that we have to import vast armies of people from all over the world living on the minimum of money, living in bad conditions because our people are no good, does not wash with me. I'm back tomorrow at six. At ten tonight, it's Tom Swarbrick. Now, it's Ian Dale. Thanks, Nigel. As part of our coverage to mark Mental Health Awareness Week, tonight at nine I'll be hosting a phone-in on loneliness, which has become such an important factor in the area of mental health that there's even a minister for it. How have you coped with being lonely in the coronavirus crisis, and what are your tips for others to overcome it? We'll get the latest on the spat between the government and Transport for London on the conditions attached to the government bailout with the Minister for London, Paul Scully. We'll take a look at how the bus and coach industry can survive the crisis and head for a bright future and we'll be speaking to Shadow Health Minister Liz Kendall. That's all coming up between now and 10, starting of course with the LBC News Hour.